So I am pretty excited today. Microsoft released 14 new text and array functions that are only available for some users on the Insider channel, and they'll be released gradually to everyone else. Uh, so my job here today is just to give you a sneak preview so that when it does drop on your channel or your version of Excel, you're totally ready to use it because you already got this quick tutorial on how they work and what problems they're supposed to solve. So let's jump right in. So I want to start with the text functions first. Let's say we have these names. So these are last name, comma, first name, comma, middle name. And in the old days, meaning right now in Excel, we generally split these apart with the left, mid, and right functions. But for some people, these are a little complicated to use. So with the new text functions, you have alternatives that are so much easier to use. Let's get started. We have one that's called text before. So text before has these two required arguments and two optional arguments. And let's just start by selecting the text that we're working with. And because we wanna split each name into separate columns, what we notice as the common delimiter is a comma and a space. So we put that in double quotes, comma, space, double quotes. And our next argument, instance number, in this case, we want the last name. So the instance number will be one. One is the default, so we don't have to enter that here. But if we'd wanted the first name, we'd type two as the instance number. Since one is the default, we can skip that here. And for this one, we also want to ignore case. So we could have ended with the required arguments here. So we want to grab all the text that's before the first comma. So now we have the last name. Pretty easy. This works great because in the old days, we'd have to figure out how many characters come before that delimiter and have Excel work that out before we can truly extract where the last name ends. So this is super easy. And here for the first and middle name, we can use the text after function. Same principle. The delimiter would be comma space, close parenthesis, and now we have the first and middle name. So easy. All right, what if we wanted three distinct columns? So we wanted last name, first name, middle name. We'd probably use text split. So let's get rid of what we have here. This makes it so easy. A1, comma, the delimiter for each column will be that comma space. We don't need them split into different rows and there will be no empties, so we don't need to pad with anything. We only need the required arguments here. And this is so cool. Text before, text after, and text split just saves us so much time. All right, when would we ever use that ignore case argument? Let's try it with another data set. So we want to grab the last two characters, the last two letters of each code that's here. So we use the text after function. The text we're working with is the one in cell A1. Our delimiter will be the uppercase A. Doesn't matter the instance number, there's only one uppercase A in each case. But let's use true for the last argument and make it case insensitive to see what happens. All right, so this one works fine. We've got the last two characters. But for the text in A3, we end up with the last three characters because it recognized the letter A and we asked it to be case insensitive. So we can either change that or omit that argument since, since case sensitive is the default. And now we have the last two letters, which is what we're looking for. All right, now in text split, there is an argument that's called pad width. That's a bit new to most Excel users. We'll do a quick demo of how it works. So here, let's say we're working with this kind of text and what we wanna do is to split this text so that each sentence is in its own row. Uh, text split works fantastic for this type of task. So here it is, text split. We're working with the text in A1. Our column delimiter 
We want each word to be in a new column. So let's make that space within double quotes. Our row delimiter, remember we want each sentence to be in a new row. So our row delimiter will be a period. All right, do we want to ignore empty cells or not? Let's do both so you can see the difference. So we work with true here to ignore empty cells and pad with, let's say we pad it with a slash. And here's the result. So each sentence is in a new row. The empty cells are padded with a slash. So this looks fantastic. But here's how the formula works. Uh, these options that we've put in tell Excel what to do, how to handle the data that it's seeing. Remember that our row delimiter is a period, but periods are usually followed by spaces. So here's what happens if we use a false and we tell Excel to include empty cells. So all these cells represent the space that appears after our period. And so Excel does return cells that appear empty. So to prevent that from happening, we can either use period space as our delimiter in the first place, or change this to true and say, ignore empty cells. If there are empty cells, I don't want it to appear. And if we didn't use a pad with argument, then Excel returns its default, which is the NA error to fill out the extra spaces to complete the array. All right, so that's how we use the first three functions, text before, text after, and text split. Let's do a couple more. All right, here we've got two data sets, in this case, two Excel tables, that the first one is a table with postal codes and cities in the province of Ontario. And the second one is postal codes and cities in the province of Alberta. If we wanted to make this one big list, aside from copy paste, the other way to do this was really to use Power Query and do an append of this list. And it's a little surprising that this didn't come sooner because it's pretty often that we do want to get data from different places in Excel. So the VStack option is a great solution for this task. Here's how VStack works. VStack means vertical stack. So we just take the first array and the first array happens to be an Excel table. So I can say Ontario, that's the name of my table. That's the Alberta table. And it stacks them into one list. How great is that? The cool thing with these functions is that they really don't need a lot of uh, nesting or coding. They're beginner friendly and they're super awesome to use. Dynamic arrays make them even easier to work with because everything spills into the required number of cells. So that's vertical stack. Let's see how horizontal stack works. So here we have two sets of data, USA, Canada, USA, Canada, and specifics, statistical facts about these two countries. What if we wanted just one table or one data set going horizontally? instead of two sets of data. We can use the hstack function for that. It works pretty much the same as vstack. We just grab the array here, comma, grab the second array, close parentheses, and we have the data that we want. All right, and this looks fantastic because without doing too much work, We've got all this data stacked horizontally. Pretty easy to figure out. All right, so let's use two more array functions to work with this same data set. Let's use the choose calls. Uh, this function allows you to choose the columns that you want to return from your array or your reference. Again, we had lots of workarounds for this. Uh, some folks would use filter of filter. Choose Calls does this really easy and fast. So we've selected the array that we want, which happens to be uh, the data that was spilled from B11. So the syntax is B11 hash. So let's say we wanted everything but the second column here. So we want columns one, three, four, and five. And we got it so easy. And of course we could have done the same with the Choose Rows function. 
We just need to select the array that we're working with. That's B11 hash. And let's say we didn't want the USA data. We just wanted rows one and three. And here we have it. Pretty cool. So with that, we've covered seven of the 14 new functions. Uh, that means we have seven to go. Let's keep going. So now we want to explore two functions that are called take and drop. In some instances, take and drop can be considered alternatives to choose calls and choose rows. The difference is that these functions only work with contiguous data that's at the beginning or the end of an array. So the columns or rows that we're extracting from an array, they have to be adjacent or next to each other. But with choose calls and choose rows, you can pick what columns or rows you want to extract to your new location. And the same thing with drop. So for drop, it removes or drops data from the end of an array. So let's say I wanted to take just the first three rows from this data set. I'd use the take function, select my array. And let's say I just want to take the first three rows of data plus the header row. So four rows of that data set. And that's what I have here. I can also decide just to take uh, some of the columns. So maybe I only want to take the first two columns. I don't want to see the province. So let's put two here. And that only takes the first four rows and two columns of the original data set. So I guess you've figured out how drop works. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of take. We select the data set. What rows do we want to drop? Maybe we want to drop everything from rows one to five. So we're dropping five rows and one column. That means we don't want to see the postal code. So we only got this portion of the original data set. Notice that in each case, take and drop perform this action on data that was at the beginning, the start of the array. What if we wanted to drop data from the end of the array, or we only wanted to take rows that are at the end of the array? Then in that case, we'd use negative numbers instead of positive. So let's just experiment with that. Let's drop five rows from the end of the array and drop one column from the end. What we expect to see, one, two, three, four, five, we're going to drop these five rows and we're going to drop the last column. And that's exactly what we got. Of course, it works the same way with take data that's at the end of the array. So if we only want to take data starting with row four and we only want to take data starting at column B. So we'd be taking the last four rows of data and the last two columns. And that's what we got right here. And that's how they work. Here's another cool one, guys. The expand function. The expand function allows you to increase the dimension of your original data set by adding rows or columns to that array. So here's the array that's our starting point and that we'll want to expand. And we're telling Excel what should be the dimension of the new array that we want returned. So we'll still want six rows and we'll want a total of four columns. We already have three, so we want to add one more. And those extra cells will be padded with the text Canada. And here's what our data looks like. Isn't this fantastic? Now we did hard code the six and four here. That's the number of rows and columns, but that could just as easily have been nested by determining how many rows are in the original data set. And this is usually done this way, just using the rows function. And we could have just as easily used the columns function here and told Excel that we want to add one more. And that gives us the very same result. How cool is that? 10 functions down, four to go. Let's jump into a function that can change an array into a single column. And that's the two 
call function. Of course, the first argument is to grab the array. Ignore says there might be some values in there that you don't want to come over into your new array, like blanks or errors. Uh, and what should you do with those? In this case, we don't have blanks or errors in our original data set, so we can skip that. And this is scan by row or scan by column. Uh, scan by row means how should we return the data? Since everything is going to be in a single column in a list, should we do postal code city province, postal code city province, or should we grab all the postal codes, then all the cities, then all the provinces. So let's see how they both look, just so you can have an idea of how this works. So this is scanning by row. So let's type true. Now we have all the column A values returned first, then column B, then C. And if you figured out how to call works, then you pretty much know how to row works. Grab the same array and let's scan by column because that probably makes more sense for this data set. And here's what it looks like. Let's take a look at the ignore parameter of this function for a minute. We'll use another data set. So let's say we had this data set that had a couple of errors, but then we wanted this array to be converted into a single column. Now we just use the to call. We use the array that's in A3. Now, if we keep this at the default, which is to keep all the values that are in the original data set, then we only need the required argument and we get these errors in there, which we probably don't want. So what we'll need to do is to enter the parameter that allows us to ignore the errors. So they're not returned in the result. So that's a two. And do we want to scan by column or by row? So we want the words of each sentence to be returned one after the other. We don't want to scan by column, but instead by row. We type false, and here's our result. And now we're down to our final two functions, wrap calls and wrap rows. Here's how they work. What these two functions do is to convert a single column or a single row into a two-dimensional array because we get to tell Excel to wrap the data to the next line. Here's an example. Let's use the list that starts in A6, and let's use our wrap count as two. So what this did was to take the original data set and convert it into an array that has two rows, where there are two rows until all the values have been accounted for. See this NA at the end? This is because we had nine values. So there's an extra cell here, and the default is to have an NA error. If we don't want to see that NA, then we can pad that. Maybe we want to see nothing. We just want to see an empty cell. So here's what we do. And wrap rows works in much the same way. Let's use another data set. Let's use this one. And let's use the number four. Tell Excel that if there are any extra cells to return an empty cell. And there we have it. So we have the rows flowing this way, but we restrict the output so that the result is shown in a maximum of four columns. And the rest gets wrapped into the available rows. So we've just examined all 14 of these new text and array functions that were released in the first quarter of 2022. I hope that you'll have as much fun using them as I have, and I'm sure that this will make handling complex tasks in Excel so much easier. Ready to learn more about Microsoft Excel? Then check out the full course on GoSkills.com. Click the link in the description.